how does a large public decentralized university commit to education abroad and intercultural experience to truly transform both practice and culture? The University of Minnesota's 20th anniversary of the Curriculum Integration Project provides the opportunity to reflect on the success and long-term impact of the work now acknowledged and emulated internationally. What came to be known as the Minnesota Model was founded upon a broad and deep collaboration with executive leadership, faculty, academic advisors, student services, and study abroad professionals, and in fact, the broader University of Minnesota community. It is with great pride that we take a moment to tell our story. In the late 1990s, the University of Minnesota began a pilot project to test new ways to integrate study abroad into the curricula. We're looking into increasing the numbers of study abroad and trying to think of ways to increase the numbers outside of the liberal arts, especially. And we could see that in the technical field, such as engineering, the numbers were very, very low. We decided to make a joint position and hire somebody to look into how and why and what we could do to increase the numbers there. So we looked into talking with the key players in the college, and that was including the directors of undergraduate studies, and also discussing with students from their perspective. The pilot project increased student participation substantially, doubling participation each year. It offered a model for interactions with other academic units. What was then the Institute of Technology and is now the College of Science and Engineering was the first college to really step up and also to put their own resources towards growing study abroad. And so by co-funding a position that would be embedded in the college and would embed in the culture and be someone that the faculty got to know, um, that trust was built up very early, particularly within that college. The year before the curriculum integration project started in that college, one student from the entire college went abroad. Within five years, it was about 150 to 175. And so the exponential gains just based on developing those relationships and identifying those opportunities really was the path that we realized could be replicated across the university. Over time, as we've evolved curriculum integration, we now have shared positions in five colleges. And the model really works. The staff member is working with us from the Central Study Abroad office, but also really gets to know the culture of the college and the people in the college in a very different way. With the full support of top administrators, grants were pursued to fund the development of this model. Grants were awarded by the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, or FIPSI, and later the Bush Foundation, and the integration work expanded to nearly every college on all four campuses at the University of Minnesota. We first wrote a grant to FIPSI, which was basically a, a seed grant designed to help us sort of hone the model of working with individual departments and working with faculty, leadership, advisors on very major specific study abroad materials and programs. So that initial grant started and we could see that it was working out quite well. That's when we started to discuss going to the Bush Foundation to support an effort that would be campus-wide and actually all the U of M campuses. And so we used the results from the FIPSI activities, which included the individual work with departments and some site visits overseas. We wrote this inch and a quarter or so uh, proposal and uh, it was submitted to the Bush Foundation. Next thing we knew, we had this $900,000 grant. And what I'm very proud of is not just what we accomplished in curriculum integration as an, as an idea, but that we did it across multiple campuses. The leadership of the University of Minnesota placed priority on providing international perspectives as part of the undergraduate experience. Past presidents Mark Udoff and Robert Brunix enthusiastically supported experiences abroad as one way to integrate international perspectives into their curriculum. So I met with Bob and Bob basically said, Gene, I'm gonna turn you loose with international and trust what you do. 
And I should also mention that President Udoff, somewhere out of the blue, announced that we were going to have 50% of our students in study abroad. I had never had a discussion with him about it. It was as much a surprise to me as anyone else. And quite frankly, I wasn't too happy when I first heard it. But it turned out to be a pretty good deal because it was a stretch goal. We can take some great pride in the fact that this became a national model. I always feel so fortunate that the leadership of the university and certainly Jean Allen shifted immediately to asking us what it would take. And I like to point out to people who now say, well, you're Minnesota, of course that's easy for you to do. But at that time, we were at the bottom of the Big Ten for our participation rates. Uh, we are a large decentralized urban campus. There are so many reasons why people said it could never work. And I think what we did was to boldly shift to, but what if it could work? What would we need in terms of removal of barriers and opportunities for students. And so you really can't highlight enough, shift to things like financial aid, uh, having all credits abroad be resident credit, all of these pieces that were the infrastructure that once we recruited the students, it was uh, so much easier for them to go because they didn't have those systemic barriers. A great example of a systemic barrier was how students could use their scholarships. and. When we started, they couldn't use their scholarships to support st their study abroad experiences. So what it amounted to was uh, people working on curriculum integration spent some time working with people like Bob Kavave, Craig Swan, Wayne, Wayne Ziegler to show them why students should be able to use their scholarships. I mean, if it's going to be integrated, the scholarships have got to be integrated. And if the scholarships can't be used, then the study abroad thing is not going to count. One of the very first things that we worked on was a series of focus groups with students to find out what are the barriers? Why is it that they're not studying abroad? They were interested in international study, but they didn't feel that it was something for them, thinking of their major degree programs, they felt like it was not really an option for them. We needed to have a different approach and start to think about what the programs were, how they were discussed, and then very importantly, that the people who are helping students make decisions, namely the advisors, needed to be involved in this project. And so that's when things started to fall into place. I think the brilliance of the early curriculum integration initiative was that those individuals involved in the, the, the grant writing really understood that addressing the barriers would be an important part of making sure that there was success. And the idea of the five Fs was really, I think, one that uh, it was a mnemonic device for helping people understand what the barriers, barriers were to study abroad. The barriers to study abroad were identified as the five Fs, fit for academic fit, faculty for all of the people who represent uh, the campus, the faculty, the staff, um, others around the university, aspect of finance, which was critical, the cost of study abroad, whether it be a real barrier or a perceived barrier to study abroad. Family, all students had some type of family that influenced them and families needed to be educated also about study abroad. And then finally, fear. And fear really represented that developmental process that a student really experiences while they're in college. And they may not be afraid of study abroad, but developmentally we needed to meet students where they were at. What became known as the University of Minnesota's Minnesota model of study abroad is based upon several guiding principles and concrete goals. An innovative pedagogy was developed to assess the undergraduate curriculum and how faculty, academic advisors, and education abroad professionals partner to motivate students to study abroad. We emphasize that we are interested in the long-term impact that the transformation of attitudes and behaviors about study abroad will bring to our institution and involving key leadership on each campus. 
the Minnesota model as it applies to study abroad curriculum integration really is the brilliance of what this curriculum integration project really kind of encompassed. And that was that we were going to uh, develop relationships with uh, people all around the university, academic advisors, faculty, other staff. We were all going to be teachers and learners, that those individuals were going to learn from us about what study abroad is, and we were going to learn from them about what role they played in a student's life and uh, learn more about their curriculum, their advising structures. There were a lot of people across uh, many colleges, campuses, and support areas of the university who really learned about what study abroad was and how they could support students in their role, um, whether they were financial aid counselors, career advisors, or faculty. And I think it was that movement, people perceiving study abroad as just an add-on and something that wasn't possible for all students to all of a sudden individuals having an awareness of what study abroad could be for students, um, which we documented with our, our data collection. Some of the hires that took place as a result of curriculum integration and a result of the grants themselves, we were pulling people from the colleges instead of somebody who would be an international education expert. One of those was Lynn Anderson, who was the director of advising in the College of Liberal Arts, who had deep knowledge of how staff advising worked, and she brought that into the curriculum and integration project. Until we started working in the colleges and applying the methodology of curriculum integration, the idea of equivalency course mapping had not really been done. And there were these assumptions everyone made about certain disciplines, such as engineering. Um, the, the belief was that it was just not possible for these students to go abroad. But I think one of the things that's been important throughout the whole project is that we constantly questioned the assumptions and said, well, where could it be possible? So if we knew that the third and fourth year of the curriculum and engineering did make it difficult, then where were the opportunities in the second semester of the sophomore year? Or for short-term programs that could support electives in upper division technology. So it was really the process of working with the curriculum and finding the places and moving things around with the leadership of the departments to make space for these experiences to be integrated lockstep so that a student could be told their first day with an advisor, if you were looking to go abroad, here's the semester where it would work best. And that was such a shift in how we advised students and had them plan for their degree programs. Assess, Match, Motivate encompassed everyone's participation and um, really takes into account everybody, every single person around campus. How do I work with faculty? How do I work with faculty? That I heard over and over again um, as we were working on the curriculum integration publication, but also on the questions that people would bring forward when we would present curriculum integration at the various conferences and elsewhere. And I think the, the, the short answer that we had over and over again was that you need to get to know those faculty and they need to get to know you. The old model of just assuming that people knew what study abroad was, wasn't going to work anymore. That we as international educators had a role to educate faculty, staff, and colleagues around campus about what international education and study abroad, education abroad, has become, and they have a role in educating us about their degree plans, their advising structures, and other mechanisms that they use to support students to succeed in higher education and graduate from our universities. Site visits were an important part of the strategy that was built into the initial proposal for the grants. Um, and we had no idea how impactful they would be. And so we've continued funding them for years and years. It's really important to acknowledge how many of the advisors and staff and faculty have not had opportunities abroad themselves, or if they have, it's been as a tourist or a traveler. So for them to have the opportunity to go and learn what education abroad looks like because it's very different um, and very exciting and to meet students as they are going through this transformation on site um, 
Really, it was a game changer in terms of how they advise students in terms of going abroad. We made an effort when we were visiting different universities, different programs, to educate the faculty about what the different kinds of program models were, what kind of support did the students get. So we were trying to get them comfortable with the idea that their students would be in the hands of these other places for some amount of time, and also then introduce them to relevant you know, faculty and, and facilities in their fields so that they could really feel like, okay, the students are supported, the people here know what they're doing, and there's some really exciting coursework or lab work or internship possibility that my students could take part in. And it was really great to see okay, the visits were set up and they were interesting, but then in the evenings we would all be together and the faculty from different disciplines would be discussing with each other the different possibilities. They would start to think about, oh, maybe I would like to do a short-term program and take students abroad to a place that I know about. You know, I did my postdoc in Budapest, maybe I could take a group there someday. And, you know, so these discussions really got started. And for some of the faculty, it was actually the first time they, they'd ever been abroad, let alone thinking about studying, you know, sending their students abroad. So they were very impactful. Learning abroad Major advising pages or maps are an innovation of the University of Minnesota's Study Abroad Curriculum Integration Initiative. Maps describe academic considerations for study abroad and highlight specific study abroad programs approved by faculty and academic advisors. This innovation is attributed to Chip Peterson, who envisioned a resource that could be shared between units. They began as Study Abroad Major Advising Sheets, or SAMASES. These have long been the highest profile product of the University of Minnesota's curriculum integration efforts and represent the dialogue that takes place between faculty members and advisors in academic departments and Learning Abroad Center. Partnership with our Office for Measurement Services to come up with a really robust evaluation plan that included online surveys, and you know, focus groups. And we were able to demonstrate through that rigorous evaluation uh, that we did of the grant that the work had an impact. And that probably was one of the highlights for me was being able to show that not only could an idea be implemented, but we could also prove that it was making an impact. We were the first university in the country to do time to graduation data that basically proved that students who studied abroad did not add time to their education. And that was the widely held belief up until then, that if a student went abroad, it was a nice thing to do, but it probably added time. And we actually didn't know the answer when we started the statistical analysis, but the answer in every single college on campus was that students who studied abroad graduated in a more timely fashion than those who didn't. And that was a game changer because one of the university's foci at the time was to improve graduation rates. And so when you can prove that what you do helps retain students and helps them graduate in a more timely fashion. The initial methodology focused on the need to assess learning goals for departments and majors, find matches abroad, and motivate students to pursue the opportunities. It did, however, quickly become obvious that the current portfolio of program options could not accommodate many areas of the curriculum. The university needed to expand options through a targeted effort to identify more external quality program partners for gaps in curricular niches. In addition, it was imperative to develop more options in direct collaborations with academic departments. Shorter term instructor-led programs and new programs at old sites needed to be part of the strategy. As a nod to the need for program development and a rigorous plan for evaluating the methodology, resources, and program quality, facilitate and evaluate were added to the methodology. I started asking a lot of questions. And uh, one of the questions that I started asking was, why don't we have any short-term programs in study abroad? Oh, those, those are not good programs. I said, well, I don't believe that. And the reason I don't believe it is because 10 days in Morocco, after living in Australia for a year, 10 days in Morocco changed my life in a major way. In my role as the program director for instructor-led programs, it was in its inception and it was three credits, three weeks, 
$3,000. Maybe we had about five programs because I was so interested in it. When you're dealing with all the different faculty across all the colleges and all the departments, it's just amazing the interest that they have, the expertise that they have, and the locations where they really feel that their topic can come alive and be the most impactful for students and students learning. There's something about teaching abroad. Those that do it are very passionate. And so to find some of those people, those key allies, and then to use them to be talking to other people throughout the university. They may have been teaching a class on campus for five years, that same class over and over, but once you take it abroad, it, it widens it, it opens it up. And you're bringing in all these different aspects, again, could be guest lectures, it could be the visits that they're taking, different scholarship that's happening within that particular country or region of the world. And that, I think, is the twofold reason why faculty that work with us tend to be very passionate and excellent because it is increasing their own expertise and they're really serving students at the University of Minnesota. I think as we've evolved curriculum integration, one of the most important things that we've done is to go back to some of those traditional sites that did grow out of the College of Liberal Arts and look for ways that we could integrate non-traditional curriculums. So for instance, we have a, a, a 35 year old site in Montpellier, France that was developed for French students, but it now has tracks for business students and education students that actually count towards their licensure where those courses are taught in English. So by building on the resources we had, but continuing to always go back and say, who is still being underserved and how could we create something innovative using the structures we already have um, that's where a lot of the exciting curriculum work is happening now. I would work with faculty in departments and colleges to identify what is the gap within their offerings abroad for their students and then identify where it is that we want that to be taught, whether that be in Senegal or Sicily or in Florence. And once we've identified that, then we'll find faculty that have the qualifications to teach that course being taught the, the academic content and beyond the experiential learning to bringing in intercultural learning and the importance of that for students. So that students were going abroad and not just learning about biology in Australia. They were really thinking about the other, they're thinking about their role, understanding the other, understanding different mores, how things are done differently in other countries and being very accepting of that and the role of understanding difference and how much can be done within that three week span of time. One of the goals to have more students of color participate in study abroad. And there were really no concrete methods for seeking that goal in the grant. When I read the grant and uh, had just come out of working in a collegiate setting and also in the multicultural affairs unit on campus, and I knew a lot of people who um, cared deeply about the educational experiences of students of color at the University of Minnesota. And we proactively, in that very first retreat we had, which was shortly after September 11th, um, 2001, we brought forward the need to bring together people from the various campuses who cared about students of color and wanted them to also have study abroad experiences. The Multicultural Study Abroad Group was formed. One of the big uh, goals of MSEG in the early part of the Curriculum Integration Initiative was to really understand what were the perceptions of students of color and the advisors who advised them about study abroad. And one of the most disheartening but telling data points was that very few advisors across the university were talking with students of color about study abroad. And it was most profound with the African-American students. How could a student of color not only learn about study abroad, but perhaps see themselves in the study abroad experience? And we started to see new ideas come forward for short-term programs that address the Hmong student, for example, or a student of African-American heritage who maybe was interested in pursuing their own identity um, as, as an African heritage seeker. In April 2004, the University of Minnesota hosted a curriculum integration conference in an effort to create a replicable model for internationalizing the undergraduate curriculum and to offer colleagues from around the country an opportunity to present ideas and work regarding study abroad curriculum integration. Following the conference, 
the Internationalizing Undergraduate Education, Integrating Study Abroad into the Curriculum was published in August 2005, highlighting the conference proceedings. The 20th anniversary of the Curriculum Integration Project provides us with the opportunity to share with you some of the exciting outcomes due to all of our collective efforts over the years. Over the last 20 years, undergraduate experience abroad participation has grown from 861 to over 3,000 annually, and learning abroad as a percentage of degrees granted is at 35%. Since 1999, students have gone abroad on over 860 short-term programs. Approximately $9.2 million in scholarships has been awarded system-wide since 2002, and each year our students benefit from the additional support of more than $420,000 and pre-negotiated fee reductions with our affiliate partners. Over the last 20 years, the Learning Abroad Center has engaged over 450 campus partners with on-site opportunities, including program reviews, familiarization visits, and program development opportunities. Since 2000, over 5,000 campus attendees have participated in Learning Abroad Center sponsored events. In 2012, the Learning Abroad Center launched a new initiative to articulate a plan for career integration. Built upon the proven methodologies of the Curriculum Integration Initiative, the focus shifted to integrating students' experiences abroad into their career and life planning. Adopting the mantra of before, during, and after, the LAC engaged career colleagues with the goal of better integrating career considerations into advising, preparation, and program design and focusing on our partnership with employers, recruiters, and graduate or professional program admissions committees. The initiative resulted in some of the first research on the career impact of study abroad in the U.S., including data provided by over 700 University of Minnesota alumni reflecting on the short and long-term impact of their experiences abroad. As well as hosting three successful national conferences on the topic, three dedicated publications, multiple articles and chapters, and national resources have been authored, produced, and co-edited by Learning Abroad Center staff with ongoing consultation and engagement with our U of M career professionals. Curriculum integration has also been critical to our successes in equity and diversity and identifying how we can serve underrepresented students in education abroad, particularly as we evolved into career integration. The argument for many students for whom, perhaps as first-generation college goers, um, the investment is already really big from their family and, and there are concerns or perhaps a belief that education abroad is an add-on. The more we can make the argument that this is an investment that will have an impact on their career and their life, um, that's when we see success in this. And so, of course, the credits have to work towards the degree program. Of course, the experiences have to be relevant for their career goals because that's the most important tool we have to engage those students in education abroad. Sometimes when I travel or go to conferences, people will say, oh, do you guys still do curriculum integration? And it's always funny to me because actually it's so woven into everything we do at the Learning Abroad Center and at the University of Minnesota that of course we do it. And, and the funding ran out an awfully long time ago, but we figured out a sustainable model, uh, which is really speaks to the success of the innovations that is still as part of our work and something that we do every day. So of course we still do curriculum integration, but it has led us down interesting new pathways such as career integration. My summary of this is that you have to create an infection, an infection for study or learning abroad. And when faculty are involved either through the Learning Abroad Center or their own colleges, they become increasingly enthusiastic about this because it is impossible to go on a short-term program with a group of students and not see what they are learning and appreciating in another culture, in another country, and that they can hardly wait to do something like this again. We have something to learn from other cultures. It's not just getting students out into another country for a nice experience, but it is to enrich their lives and to help them understand better that uh, this is not the only culture. There are many cultures, and you've got to learn to work within the culture you are, are living in. CI was a successful approach because 
it put the emphasis on, on the students' degree programs as the starting point and that international study should be a seamless part of their time at Minnesota and that it was something that the colleges could be proud of if they could get their students abroad and having these experiences. And it's the power of one, I believe, that is so profound and that each individual person had that ability through that empowerment of having more knowledge about study abroad and more tools to use to support students with study abroad that really helped them have an impact on their individual students. People got very excited about our role in undergraduate education and I think that's a really important why it's, it succeeded. While we were developing these relationships across campus, while we were working with the colleges and really respecting their curricular choices. Um, I think one of the things that we've always had as a philosophy is that there is a, a request or requirement, a suggestion that every department should be engaged, but we don't dictate how. We let them all figure out what was the appropriate plan and opportunities for their colleges or their degree program. There can be no question that the curriculum integration project that started here at the University of Minnesota 20 years ago changed the University of Minnesota in a positive, measurable, and sustained way. It also changed the field of international education such that the term and the concept is now commonly accepted and it's understood to be an essential component of internationalization. The, the integration, the coordination, the expectation, if you will, that international experiences could be integrated into curriculum across disciplines for all students. Higher education undertakes many bold initiatives in the interest of development and innovation. And while each of them informs, not all of them endure. But curriculum integration continues to provide our faculty, our students, and our staff with a method by which the near and the far, the familiar and the strange, the known and the unknown can be linked in a learning environment that has the potential to change the trajectory of a student's life. We are so proud of the history of curriculum integration and really grateful to those who championed the idea when it was new. And we look forward to the next 20 years of advancing international intercultural understanding. My sincere thanks to all of those who kept their eyes on the prize and worked to change higher education and ultimately the world.